Good morning, everybody. Did everyone have a good night last night? <laughs> We're really excited to have you back again today for day two of Scaling Bitcoin. I'm Victoria Van Eyck. I'm Bobby Lee. Very excited. Good morning, everyone. And I want to introduce our program chair, Pinder Wong. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm going to be saying. Code of conduct, code of conduct, code of conduct. Um, four C's, code of conduct. We're trying to regulate behavior code as well, obviously. Communication, hopefully, leads to collaboration and hopefully emergent consensus. So with that, I'm going to introduce the program chair, uh, Niha Nurullah. Hi, everyone. So I, help, I hope everyone really enjoyed day one. I thought it was quite fascinating and interesting. We still have a lot of stuff in stock for day two. Uh, so a quick announcement. The afternoon is a little bit uh, more up in the air. So we are going to let people sign up to lead discussion groups. And the format for this is kind of flexible. It can be an actual discussion group. It can be a talk. You can teach someone something. And we're going to have easels out here in the space where we do coffee in the break. And you can just sign up for a time slot in a room and go over there and see what you think is interesting and what you want to go to this afternoon. Um, just as a preview, we are going to have a couple of talks that we couldn't fit into the main sessions happen during that time as well in here. And so um, definitely look out for those. Those are going to be really interesting. And then I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Peter Weil, who's going to be talking about segregated witness. Uh, so I'm Peter Wiley, apparently, um, and I'll be talking about uh, segregated witness for Bitcoin. Um, bef before I can uh, explain the title of what I'm going to talk about, uh, let me just give a bit of context. Um, yes, this thing works too. Um, so uh, very briefly, we all know how Bitcoin transactions work. Every transaction consists of a list of inputs that refer to previous outputs being spent. Every input uh, has the reference of the transaction ID from the output being spent and a signature to prove that it's allowed, plus um, an amount and a script in every output to uh, a script or address. Um, what this presentation will be mostly about is the question of whether all of this data is equally important. And I changed this slide, why wasn't it updated? Um, so, uh, in particular, we'll be talking about the signatures. And it's important to realize here that signatures are really only needed for fully validating nodes. And so this means that as a lightweight client, usually you are not actually validating uh, the signatures, yet they are part of a transaction, so you have to download them. Um, furthermore, if you are using a full node that's synchronizing historical history, uh, you also don't actually validate all the signatures in there. Uh, currently, there's a mechanism using checkpoints, which we'd like to deprecate soon in favor of another mechanism, but the result will still be that we're not actually validating all signatures from years ago uh, of history. There's no need for this. So, these signatures are really only needed at the time of validation. They also don't ever go into the UTXO set, the database of, of all uh, unspent coins that Um, so we don't, these don't enter the, the, spent, the database of unspent transaction output set, and this is a database that all uh, full nodes have to maintain, at least in the current model, uh, to be able to do validation. This is a, a significant cost on, on the resource uh, of, of uh, both um, just keeping a node running, but also for the speed of propagation to be fast enough, access to this UTXO set needs to be fast. And so it's important to notice that of all the data in a transaction, signatures don't go into this. And yet they account for 60% of the blockchain. Um, so segregated witness is ultimately about trying to ignore these wherever we can. And that's in various uh, places. So segregated witness, where does the name witness come from? Um, for now, 
it's really just another word to refer to the script sig or the signatures inside transactions. Later I'll extend it to mean more, but uh, for now it's just a synonym. And the reason for this name is these signatures are not really a part of a transaction effects. Uh, you, they don't describe what the transaction is doing. The only thing they do is prove that the transaction was authorized by the previous owners of the coins. And even further, there are usually multiple possible signatures valid for the same transaction or at least the same transaction effect. And we don't really care what it is. We just care that one existed. And, and uh, this is something that's called in such a claim for something exists and giving an example for it is called a witness in math. It's a term used in cryptography in some cases too. Um, I said we don't care that what it is, well, we, we do for um, auditing purposes, as uh, I guess in a multi-sign setup where you have one of three people who are able to uh, spend a particular output, perhaps you'd really like to know still which it was, which we'll solve that later, but um, inside a transaction you don't actually care. So, segregated witness. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just drop the signatures wherever we liked? Uh, the reason we cannot do this is because the signatures are part of the hash of a transaction. And if we would just drop the signature data from a transaction, the hash wouldn't work out anymore. You wouldn't be able to validate that they're actually part of a block. You wouldn't be able to prove that a particular output being spent actually came from that transaction. So that's not something we can do. Uh, but let's simplify the problem and say, what if we can just redesign Bitcoin from scratch? You know, um, what if, um, what if, well, you were designing an altcoin, uh, there's no, really no way uh, why you would do it the way Bitcoin did. And that's actually also what we did in our uh, sidechain alpha. So um, what you would do is you would mark the signature data as special. Um, here indicated by a green color on this slide. Um, and everything but the green part is what goes into the hash of a transaction, uh, but the, the, the signature isn't. It, it's just a piece of data that's still there, but we, we don't really consider it part of it. Um, so this would obviously allow you to, to drop this data. Um, for tampering purposes and other reasons, you still want to make blocks commit to it. So uh, the reason is I am a node relayed, relaying a fully valid block with all signatures in it that are, that are all valid. Um, I, I relay it to another node and um, I just change the signature data. This node does not see that this block is being tampered with. The only thing this node sees is, well, this block is invalid, I'm going to mark it as invalid. Yeah, you won't, don't want that to, to be able to happen. So for that reason, we still need to make the blocks themselves, not the transactions, but the block commits to the signatures uh, of transactions. And the way this could be done, for example, uh, because we're all hypothetically speaking at this point, is change the Merkle tree uh, that blocks have to commit to the transaction IDs into a two-sided tree where one side uh, refers to the transaction IDs without the signatures, and then there's a second tree uh, exactly constructed in exactly the same way. However, now it contains the hashes of the witnesses or the signatures at this point. Um, so what are the advantages of this? Um, f as I said, it allows you to drop the signatures from relay whenever you're relaying to a node that's uh, not actually doing the full validation at this point in time. And it also allows us to effectively go prune this data from history. Uh, maybe we're uh, fine with not all nodes in the network actually maintaining these gigabytes of signatures that are buried uh, under years of proof of work anymore. And to, to show you how much data this actually is, this is what the Bitcoin blockchain looks like today, the red line. Uh, the green line is what it would look like without the signatures. 
so it, it's a pretty significant change. But maybe more importantly, this change also solves all forms of unintentional malleability. Um, this, this is a big problem right now for uh, all sorts of more complicated contracts that rely on being able to spend outputs of unconfirmed transactions. Because the inherent problem is the signature data already does not go into the data being signed, but it does go into the transaction ID. And we use the transaction ID to refer to previous transactions. As a result, the signature data can change, changing the transaction ID, but not the validity of a block. Um, this is a problem that, that uh, I've been working on before as a proposal called BIPS62 uh, that I re recently withdrew for the reason that BIP62 actually cannot solve uh, various forms of important malleability. In particular, um, ECDSA, what we are using for signatures, has a f an, an, an inherent problem, um, namely, you can, as a signer, as someone who has the private key, and this is not malleability, but you can just change the, the signature into something else, which means that, um, even with strong restrictions on what can be changed, you can never change, for example, in a two of three multisig, you cannot prevent only one of three of the participants to change their uh, signature. And this is a form of malleability as the only people you would want to be able to construct a valid transaction are those who had that right in the first place. So only when all of them agree, this should be possible. And by just separating out the signature data from a transaction, this, this problem is completely solved. Uh, there are still forms of malleability that remain. Uh, namely, uh, Bitcoin has a mechanism for selecting what part of a transaction are being signed, the signature hash flags. So this still uh, remains possible, obviously. Um, but that is something you, you always opt into. It's never a default. So, um, for, for, and, and this directly has an effect on uh, scalability for uh, various uh, microtransaction payments, channels, systems such as Lightning and others, <coughs> which I believe the next two talks will be about actually. So, this brings us to the actual full title of my talk, Segregated uh, Witness for Bitcoin, because so far I was talking hypothetically uh, and the, the changes that were needed to, to the scheme I presented so far was not something we could easily deploy into Bitcoin. It would change all trans uh, data structures. It, w it would pretty much change every piece of software that was ever written for Bitcoin. Um, so we, we really can't uh, redesign Bitcoin from scratch. So this seemed a hard problem and I personally dismissed this as a solution for a long time uh, as, as not something really viable until uh, I believe it was uh, Luke Dash Jr. who discovered that this is actually possible to do this as a soft fork. Um, and so that's um, what, I'm, what this slide presents. Um, what we're going to do is Inputs, we just deprecate the, the signature field inside of inputs. Uh, say it, it's going to be an empty string from for now on. Um, obviously, an empty signature is not going to be able to spend an actual output that requires a signature. So instead, the outputs do not push the scripts that we require to be satisfied, um, but we, we, we encapsulate it in, and uh, just push it as a piece of data. And uh, th this allows us to, so this effectively to every old node, ev every node that's not using this system, that's an anyone can spend output. Uh, this is just an output that pushes a piece of data on the stack and doesn't do anything uh, else. So it, it's an anyone can spend, but in a soft fork, we can add a new rule that um, restricts what is valid. And we add a rule that says, whenever we see such a, a form of a script being pushed as a data element in a script, we give it a new meaning. Namely, well, this is actually a new type of script um, which is able 
to instead of taking its inputs from the signature field, it takes it from the witness. And the witness becomes a third part of a transaction. In addition to the inputs and the outputs, there is a third field which is a wit uh, called the witness. And again, for now, it only contains the signature. Um, and so doesn't this change a transaction completely? Well, it's just serialization. So we can say whenever we relay data to an old node, uh, we can just drop the witness um, because to them, this transaction is valid without it. Furthermore, because the witness does not affect the transaction ID, you can say it's not really a part of a transaction. It, it's just another piece of data we relay along with the transaction instead. Um, the scheme we were using before to make the block still commit to the witness data isn't possible because we cannot uh, just change the structure of the Merkle tree. Uh, that too would be a hard fork. But what we can do instead is build two separate Merkle trees, one with commitments to all the witnesses and one with commitments to just the transaction data as the one that exists now and make the root of the Merkle tree of the signatures uh, store it in a Coinbase transaction. So uh, this gives us almost the same uh, uh, power, though it, it's uh, soft fork compatible. Now, there are more things we can do here and, and these were things that were really just discovered along the way while, while this uh, solution was being thought of. Uh, one is, um, as we're really adding a new script type uh, and the script gets encapsulated in, in a push now, uh, we can say, well, every script in here is going to first with one extra byte, which is a version byte. Um, and the reason for doing so is making it easier to do soft forks. Right now, anytime we want to introduce new functionality to the Bitcoin script, really the only possibility we have is redefining an op nop. And the only redefinition we can do is uh, make the op nop do something special, do a test. If it fails, the transaction is invalid as a whole. And if, it's, if it is valid, it must have absolutely no effect at all because someone, even if it returns true, someone could, for example, add an, a negation after it, which would make something that went from uh, valid to invalid go from uh, invalid to valid, which would make it a hard fork. So this is a reason why previous soft forks in particular, um, check lock time verify and check sequence verify, um, BIP 65 and BIP 112, I believe. Um, the only thing that they do is redefine uh, an op opcode. Now, th th this is sad. Th there are way, way nicer improvements to script that we couldn't imagine. And um, by adding a version byte with the semantics that whenever you see a version byte, you don't know you don't understand as a full node, uh, it's anyone can spend. So um, this allows us to make any change at all to the scripting language in a software compatible way. And this, this includes uh, introducing of new uh, signature types like Schnorr signature, which on themselves increase scalability by uh, reducing the size of multi-sig transactions dramatically. Um, or more uh, proposals further along the way, uh, things like Merkleized abstract syntax trees, um, which is a, t a research topic on, it, on its own almost. But th th there are really a lot of ideas of potential improvements to scripts that we could make that, that we can't do right now in Bitcoin. And this would just uh, enable it for free um, by just adding one, one more byte. Okay. Uh, something else that it allows is fraud proofs. And the realization here is that Bitcoin right now only has two real security models. Either you are a full node, you maintain a full UTXO set, and you are able to validate every script and validate every single rule in the system. Uh, the only alternative is if you don't want to maintain this is uh, only validate the headers, which is what SPV clients do uh, today. 
Uh, now, it's interestingly, in the Bitcoin white paper in its uh, simplified payment verification section actually suggested the use of fraud proofs, which is the fact that full nodes, when they detect a block with an in a rule violation in it, could um, provide the data that proves that this violation was being made and relay, re relay it along the network, which uh, other nodes uh, could then pick up that don't do full validation. In fact, this doesn't work for SPV, but it could work for um, something between a full node and, and an SPV node, where one that actually downloads the full blocks but doesn't maintain a full UTXO set. So we could go to a model where you choose to only validate a certain percentage of, um, of the UTXO set. You maintain 1%, 10%, um, whatever. Uh, and you rely on, and, and this is relying on the censorship resistance of the network. Um, so your, your security assumption goes from I'm not being sibled and there's not a collusion attack by, by miners. Uh, it goes to um, and I am not uh, censored from uh, other nodes which altogether do 100% validation. So th this is a far more scalable full node or at least partial full node model that we could evolve to. It, it, it's a security trade-off that, that we're making here and certainly not some one that everyone will want to make, but it, it doesn't affect those who do. So um, the problem with this is Bitcoin right now does not have any means of proving two of its consensus rules. So for almost all rules, there is a way of doing this. A double spend, you show the two transactions. Um, a script validation is invalid. You show the input and the output uh, and whatever. But there are two that you count right now. One is uh, subsidy fraud, namely a miner that would uh, introduce, introduce too much coins. You, you cannot prove in a short way um, that the amount introduced, the fee, was wrong because you would need to show all the inputs to all the transactions in a block and tally them up to, to do this uh, accounting. And by simply adding the input amounts to the witness data, um, you can. The, we, we add a consensus rule that the witness uh, needs to have the con correct input data. It can be pruned like all the other witness data, uh, and it allows us to prove this. Um, in addition to that, um, you can also right now not prove the spending of a non-existing input. You, if, if it's an existing input that was previously spent, you can, but you cannot actually, uh, if, if someone claims, oh, I'm spending this particular output, uh, how do you go prove that that input wasn't there? We, we, have, no, uh, we have no means of proving that it was there. Uh, so uh, these, the, the traditionally suggested solution for this is UTXO commitments where every block commits to the state of the entire UTXO set, and this would allow you to make such uh, a proof. But there is a much easier solution uh, here, and, and it, I, I felt stupid when Greg told me about this. Uh, that it, hmm? Told Greg. You told Greg. <laughs> oh. Mm. OK. Um, that uh, you, you can instead just make the witness contain the height of the block that didn't produce the output um, and, um, and the position within the, the block. And if it's wrong, you can just show a proof, well, that transaction you claim that was there isn't there, so it's wrong. And so by adding these two, uh, like uh, maybe a dozen bytes that we add to a witness for every input, we can make these fraud proofs for every single consensus rule in Bitcoin right now. Okay, so, um, Importantly, it also allows us to do soft work scaling. And this is perhaps the, the, the most uh, remarkable thing. Namely, so uh, all, all of what I've been talking about uh, has, is implemented as a prototype, though it's not, not quite ready for production right now. So I did a simulation of what the block sign size would look like if we had switched to such a model from the start. 
so the black line at the top is the actual size. The uh, dark blue part is the base data without the witness, and the light blue part is the witness data. And it's important to see that the dark blue part is the only thing that all nodes see. And it is the only part that the block size limit applies to. So I guess you can hear this coming. Uh, we can increase the block size with a soft fork this way. So uh, this, is, this is my uh, proposal for uh, what we do right now, is uh, we, we aim to get segregated witness uh, uh, in production soon. Um, and what we do is we discount the witness data by 75%. Um, there, so this enables us to say um, we allow four times as many signatures in, in the chain. What this normally cor corresponds to with the typical transaction load we've been seeing is this is around the 75% capacity increase for transactions that start using it. Um, or another way of looking at it is uh, we raise the block size to four megabytes, but only for the witness parts. The non-witness part is still limited. And this makes it a soft fork. Um, the, the reason for doing this discount, last slide. <laughs> um, the, the reason for doing this discount is that this incentivizes UTXO impact because the signature data doesn't go into the UTXO set, does not, um, can be pruned uh, and so forth. Why four times? Uh, Bitcoin Core 0 0.12 just made uh, transaction validation something like seven, seven times faster, uh, I believe. Um, numbers show in some settings, plus um, the impact on uh, relay. There are technologies now that have been discussed e earlier, IBLT, weak blocks. So um, this fixes malleability. It enables far simpler script upgrades. It enables fraud proofs. It allows pruning the witness data for historical data. It reduces the bandwidth for light nodes and historical sync. Uh, what I didn't mention before, it's P2SH compatible for old nodes. So uh, non-upgraded and upgraded nodes can still send coins to each other, though at slightly lower uh, efficiency. And this, this step is intended to give time for IBLT and weak blocks to develop. So we, we can see that these relay improvement technologies can fix the other part of the problem. When that is done, we intend to do a hard fork somewhere in the near future uh, that switches to a cost-based metric, which Jonas will talk about this afternoon, I think, um, with a limited cost growth for a short time. And this with the intention to give time for high-level payments solutions to develop, and hopefully we end up in a future where there is less demand for getting everything onto the chain. Thank you. Okay, questions? We'll have a short session for questions. I see one over there. Um, I was wondering whether it would be possible if you have the segregated witness to also change the type of signatures, so change to Schnorr signatures or some more efficient. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and would you do that? I, I would certainly like to. Okay. Um, I, 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 I'm not aiming for that right now. I think w what we need to get in, in place is a framework for allowing these upgrades to, to happen. But Over here, can you talk a little bit more about the shift for your shift from uh, telecommunications as the bottleneck to the idea of validation and storage as the bottleneck? They're bottlenecks for different types of parts of the infrastructure. Um, so th the only reason I'm, I'm fine with this is because we know of technologies that can improve the relay uh, uh, right now. I, I think that the situation, we, we, we do need to work on, on making uh, relay uh, faster. But we, we know how to do it, so this is a mod, yeah. So your, pr your proposal depends on other things that weren't listed there? Uh, no, I did list I mean, it. the idea that four megabytes would now be okay depends on other changes that weren't listed. So it, okay. 
Um, we'll talk. <laughs> okay, question over here. Um, so you said that moving the uh, signature data outside of the UTXO set. Um, it, it's never been inside UTXO set. Oh, okay. It, it's just we're now able to treat the part of a transaction that has no impact on the UTXO set separately. But it never, the signature data never had. It's just the signature data was counted identically to the rest of the transaction we did, which did have an impact on the UTXO. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs> and now we're gonna have Taj Dry, who's gonna ta uh, give us an overview of the BIPs necessary for Lightning. Hello everyone, hi, I'm Taj Dreja. I'm going to talk about Lightning Network and scalability and how different BIPs and modifications affect that. Do I click on it? No, wait, someone else is doing so. Cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, scalability of Lightning with different BIPs and some back of the envelope estimates. Okay, so I don't really have time to introduce uh, the whole idea of Lightning Network and how it works and or will work, um, but you know we've given talks about it. There's some documentation. Um, definitely ask me, Astros, if that's rusty. You know you can talk about us uh, about this after. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, I think it helps a lot with the scalability by keeping some transactions off the blockchain. Ideally, many slash most transactions off the blockchain, and they all become. Uh, you know, you just open and close channels, uh, and that's all that needs to be on the blockchain. Um, and the security is such that when it fails, it fails back to the efficiency and security of Bitcoin. Uh, so when people are cooperating, it's very efficient and very scalable. When they stop cooperating and they're jerks to each other, um, you still have Bitcoin. You know, you go, you drop right back down. So I think that's a good trade-off. Um, but how how much can this really get us, and what do we need? in order to get this. Um, so can Lightning work today? Well, maybe not today, but check back next week because uh, <laughs> BIP65, I believe, is gonna be active pretty soon. Um, however, with just BIP65, you don't really have enough. You efficient Lightning channels need time locks, relative time locks, and uh, the ability to reliably spend from an unconfirmed transaction, which is uh, sort of what segregated witness talk was about. Um, but op CLTV, the, the check lock time verify, is almost active, and in a week or two, you can probably actually use it on mainnet. And op check sequence verify may be op active soon. Um, so yeah, oh, so, so there are there are levels of lightning that we are prepared to accept. Um, so if you know we never get segregated witness, if we never get check sequence verify, well, we can still use it. It's just not as good. Um, so you know what what can we use? Uh, channels can use can work with only check lock time verify, which would be like next week or next month, but it's much less efficient. Um, so I'm gonna talk about three different models for the Lightning uh, transaction, you know, for, for channels from the least to most efficient. And uh, so these are sort of the back of envelope things, but they're, they're pretty accurate. Um, so Lightning level one is you only have check lock time verify. And to open a channel, uh, this is, Assuming that there's one participant funding the entire channel, which is, I think, going to be very common. And I, Joseph, in the next talk, will talk about how, you know, how the topology of the network will tend to build itself out. Um, but this is a fairly optimistic uh, size in that it's, it's pretty much the minimum size you can have. Uh, so to open a channel, you need one input. So you've got you know, some UTXO outpoint. You've got you know, a couple Bitcoins one signature spending from that, and then I'm saying three outputs. Uh, two of them will be two of two multi-sig with some extra opcodes, and one of them's change back to the funder. Uh, the channel close transaction is gonna be two inputs, both, you know, both the same transaction but different index, four signatures, because two of two multi-sig for both, and two outputs back to the two participants of the channel. And that's about 700 bytes because they're, you know, more signatures. And signatures are really what take space and time in these transactions. Putting new out points is pretty easy. Um, channel duration is going to be one week. I'm just making that up. It might be a little longer, might be uh, shorter. But 
in the check lock time verify only model, this channel duration is fixed at the outset of the channel. So when you open it, you know it lasts at most one week. And it lasts at least one week as well. Um, you know, if, if the other guy on your channel disappears or becomes uncooperative, you have to wait the entire duration. So that's, that's the trade-off in that like, okay, you know, it's taking a transaction in order to open the channel for, a, for however long. If you make it really long, like a month or two, well, then you can keep it open longer, do more things with it for, you know, one transaction open. But if your counterparty disappears, you got to wait that whole month. On the other hand, if you go to a day, you say, hey, I'll just open the channel for a day. Um, it's less risky. And then if your counterparty disappears, you've got your money back the next, the, the next day. But you have to keep renewing the channel um, with transactions on the blockchain. Uh, the other thing I'm talking about is channel monitoring so that if your counterparty goes rogue and tries to broadcast a previous channel state trying to rip you off um, in this case with only check lock time verify you must uh, the user must verify must observe that so you got to keep watching the blockchain for those you know 20 byte 20 byte uh, p2sh script and if you see that script you know okay he's trying to rip me off push my uh, transaction, which, you know, my, with his revocation hash and get my money back. Um, so you can, you know, you, it's, it's safe, but you got to keep watching during that uh, one week. And uh, the generalized channel awesomeness, which is a sort of subjective rating is, is low in this case. Okay. So lightning level two is you have op check sequence verify, or I think they were talking on the mailing list. Let's call it op maturity or I, whatever is the coolest name. Um, which what this does is uh, somewhat like op check lock time verify, but it's relative to when the input got into a block. Um, so this is a this is a really cool op code. It lets you sort of say, okay, I can spend this, but only once it's a week old, or you know a thousand blocks old. Um, this allows a lot of cool things for lightning channels. Um, the channel open, channel close transactions are pretty much the same size, uh, but the channel duration now is indefinite. So you can just keep the channel open as long as you want. Um, both participants can still close it cooperatively with, you know, immediately within 10 minutes. Um, but there is a sort of timeout period where there's the uncooperative close timeout. So let's say you, you could make that one week like in the other one. And in this model, the idea is, if my counterparty disappears, I wait around for a few hours. I'm like, he's, he's gone. Okay. I'm going to push my current channel state to the blockchain. And then I have to wait a week to actually collect my money back to an unencumbered, you know, pay to pay to pub key hash address. Um, and you can tweak that as well. So you can say, okay, I want to do it today into one day, or I want to do it a week, or I want to do it a month. Um, but all that is, is you have to be watching the blockchain at least once in that time period. So you could set it to a week and say, okay, well, I'm going to check my phone or check the blockchain at least once a week. So that's safe. Um, but that, so that channel duration matters for, uh, so, so the, the timeout for the uh, check sequence verify, it matters for channel monitoring, which still must be done by the user. Um, although I guess I should clarify, the monitoring itself could be done by a third party and that third party could inform the user, hey, this happened, you should sign, you should you know, you should deal with this. So they could like email you and say like, you, you could say, Hey, if you ever see these 20 bytes on the blockchain, send me an email because that means something went wrong. And they can email you and say, Hey, you should sign to, you know, get your money back. But the user still has to sign. The user still has to, you know, do something there. Um, okay. One second. Sorry. Um, and the general, uh, generalized channel awesomeness of this channel type is medium. This is pretty good. This actually helps a lot. Okay, and then lightning level three, which I, eh, I'll, 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 I'll talk about that in a second. Um, there is a way to significantly reduce the size of the channel close transaction by about half. Not, qu not quite, actually. It's, it's not like 700 to 350. That's, those are kind of rough estimates. It's a, it's a little more than half, but it reduces it a lot. Channel duration is still indefinite. I'm assuming you still, you'll have uh, check sequence verify. Um, and the channel monitoring can now be sort of anonymously kind of untrustedly outsourced in that you say to someone, hey, if you see these 20 bytes in the blockchain, broadcast this transaction, thanks. 
Um, and that's a pretty easy thing to do. 20 bytes, you just look, look for them and you know broadcast. Um, and the generalized channel awesomeness of this channel type is, is high. Um, the way to do this is you need a reliable spend of an unconfirmed transaction. And so similar to, it, 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 it deals with malleability in that I can know, okay, here's the TX ID of a transaction. Uh, in this case, it's a transaction spending from a multi-sig address that's our lightning uh, channel. And I know that that TX ID is valid and that this could get into the blockchain and I could spend from it. I have all the, I have the signatures, I have the pre-images, I have everything I need. So I can create a transaction spending from that. However, because of ECDSA malleability, that TX ID could change. And there's an basically infinite number of TX IDs it could change to, so I can't sign them all. Uh, so I have to watch for what the TX ID is. Uh, so there's two ways to fix this. And segregated witness is one of them. Um, and segregated witness is really cool, as Sip, uh, Peter just said. And it's also kind of weird, in a, in a good way, in a good way. Um, <laughs> so that we might want some more time to test, test it out and like figure out the best ways to do it and stuff. It's a pretty big sort of rethinking of how things work. Um, I think it's cool. If segregated witness gets in, we'll totally use it. We'll code for it. Great. But there's a simpler way that also is an option, and which is just called sig hash no input. It's very simple. It doesn't fix malleability in that the TX IDs work the same. They can still change. But the signatures can be applicable to multiple TX IDs. Um, so the sig, you know, I'm, I'm not including the TX ID in my signature. So if the TX ID changes, it's okay. Um, what I am including in the signature are my outputs and my input scripts. So it still, you know, references w the correct. And also since my, I'm signing, you know, I'm signing with a pub key. So as long as I don't reuse pub keys, it's very safe. Um, there are some risks to this in that if you did it the wrong way, you could, for example, send two Bitcoins to a pub key hash, send three Bitcoins to then that same pub key hash, and then try to spend the two and sign and say, okay, I'm sending these two to this other place. Uh, a miner or really anyone, but it would, it would definitely be the miner doing it, would then redirect that signature to the three Bitcoin output and cause you to spend the three and take that extra one. Uh, so, so this is somewhat dangerous in that you don't want to reuse um, addresses with this sig hash type. Uh, so you could do it with, say, a soft fork. You could make it multi-sig only. And that way, it's much less likely that someone will be able to replay a signature um, because it would require both, let's say, if you do two of two multi-sig, it would require both people to be reusing the same pub key. So they both have to be doing something stupid. And that's, that's pretty unlikely. Um, and so if you were going to make a, a soft fork, you know, a new op multi-sig 2 with uh, sig hash no input, you could also get rid of that like zero bug where you, where you pop off a zero from multi-sig. Um, and it's, it's also more efficient that you don't have to hash um, as much data when you you know, have a large uh, transaction with lots of inputs. So like there was a sort of pathological transaction a few months ago where the entire block was one giant transaction with like, thousands of inputs. Um, and it, it was sort of like O of N squared in that since you have so many inputs, you're hashing this enormous amount of data for each signature and it looked ugly. So this, this helps a little that, but whatever. Um, so, but you know, segre segregated wisdomness would also allow this, um, you know, lightning level three channel. Um, so, and then I'll do some back of the envelope uh, calculations for, okay, how many people can use this stuff given the three different levels based on BIPs and just three different block sizes that I'm just going to throw, you know, we could have one megabyte, which is sort of BIP zero, just inertia, just go with what we have now. You could have maybe some kind of eight megabyte, which is, you know, BIP 248, I guess is, I don't think that's the actual title, but sort of an idea of do two megabytes and maybe later four and then maybe later eight and we'll meet again in 10 years in Hong Kong and see what we do after that. Um, and then what was discussed yesterday, BIP 100, where I think if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, it was like miners sort of vote and decide, but there's still a sort of 32 megabyte cap uh, within that they're deciding in that range. So these, these seem like, you know, fairly reasonable uh, sizes to discuss. And the three, you know, BIPs for Lightning Channel also seem reasonable and possible. So the assumptions I'm making for these back of the envelope calculations, 
Uh, I'm going to say half of transactions in blocks are lightning channel open and close, uh, channel open, channel close transactions, which, yeah, maybe. And I'm going to say half of the lightning network close transactions are also lightning network open transactions. So in that I'm closing one channel and immediately in the same transaction opening another channel. Uh, which is po which is you know quite possible if you have the cooperation of your counterparty. You say hey, I've got a chan you know Alice has a channel with Bob, and she says hey Bob, I want to open a channel with Carol instead. Make that into one transaction, the the Bob to Carol channel like switch on blockchain. Um, and I also assume there's no non-cooperative channel closes, which are quite a bit larger in t in size, but should hopefully be a rounding error in that like in a fraction of percent of channels actually end uncooperatively. Um, you know, you still need to have that, that, you know, that's still going to happen, but pretty rare. And I'm going to say three channels per user. And when the channels are indefinite, they tend to last around six months. So great. So with level one, that means 150 channel, uh, channels per year are needed because they're all week long, 150 closed transactions, 75 open, uh, with level two and three, you only have six channels a year and, you know, open six, close, th uh, close six, open three, because, you know, half of the, half the time those are merged. Um, so this is basic, you know, results, if you can call it that, that's kind of a uh, nice way to put it. Um, yeah. So level one, where you only have op check lock time verify, it's actually about, uh, 1.25 megabytes per user per year to do all that. Um, level two, it's about five kilobytes per user per year. And if you have segregated witness or sig hash no input, you get, you can get down to three kilobytes per user per year. So with one megabyte blocks, uh, you can have 20,000 users, uh, with just uh, check lock time verify about 5 million users with op CSV and about eight, a little over eight users. If you have all, uh, you know, the, the full, uh, segregated witness or, or check sig, uh, sig hash. Um, and then if you went, you know, and then basically those three numbers, you just multiply by eight, multiply by 32 for a block size. And you get, you know, with fairly reasonable, uh, block sizes, you can get millions to, you know, hundreds of millions of users. And, Really, users is the is the proper metric because you know how many transactions are those users going to do during the year? Lots, as many as they want. There's really not uh, much limit. Uh, once you have the channel open, you can do, you know, hundreds of transactions a day, hundreds of transactions an hour. It, it's it's going to be demand. You know, there's plenty of supply there. Um, so that's, you know, that's pretty encouraging. And and to some extent, these these are pretty vague. Um, but I would, I would also say if you do have, you know, 200 million people using Lightning Network, it's probably the case that not half of the transactions are channel open, channel closed transactions. It might be quite a, quite a bit more. It might be 80 or 90% of transactions on the blockchain end up being channel based, um, in which case you could get to, you know, 500 million or something. So that's pretty good. Uh, this is a, this is pretty encouraging. It's pretty cool. And I'm, you know, I, I'm, that's why I'm working on this stuff. <laughs> Uh, so conclusion, uh, can help out a lot with scaling relative lock time helps a lot. That's, that's the big one, right? So you go from level to one to level two, that's just huge, right? If you only, if you don't have check sequence, verify lightning still helps, but much, much less, right? You're going from 1.25 megabytes to five kilobytes. Um, and then no input or segregated witness pushes scalability even further and improves usability, right? So here you go from five kilobytes a year to three kilobytes a year, which is good definitely not the same scale of improvement as uh, one to two. However, uh, there's other things like with, with the level three, it's kind of better usability as well. Um, you can support significant fraction of all humans with reasonable block sizes. So that's great. And further research is required. I'm, you know, always say that at the end of any paper. Uh, so right now it's lots of guesses about how people will use this stuff. So thanks. Thank you, Todd. First question in the front. Hi, th thanks, Thaddeus. Um, one question, on the last slide, you, one of the assumptions was three channels per person, was that correct? Yeah. Um, so assuming that payment channels wouldn't be useful for say, you know, retail kind of sales because you wouldn't want to open a channel just to buy a coffee, just to close it immediately, right? Uh, is, that, is that a correct assumption? Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, well, I mean, maybe Joseph, will, but uh, really briefly, let's say you're buying a coffee. Yeah and you just open a channel. You say, well, I'm only buying coffee once. I'm probably never gonna be at this coffee shop. Ever. Well, but maybe I live here, whatever. I will, the coffee's five bucks. I'll put 50 bucks worth of Bitcoin in the channel and push five bucks to the coffee shop and just leave the channel open. And then someone else comes to the coffee shop and she also does the same thing. And then, but she has a channel with the grocery store. 
So there's me, coffee shop, Alice, grocery store. They all have channels. And then the next time I go to, go to the grocery store, I don't have to open a channel with the grocery store. I can just say, I will pay the coffee shop, the coffee shop will pay Alice, Alice will pay the grocery store, and it routes uh, trustlessly that payment. Okay, that answers, then that, I don't have no question. Okay. Because I was wondering how you, it was only three. I mean, it sounded like everybody would be both opening channels with everybody else, and there's no, no, no way three is reasonable. Three is maybe low. I, I'm, I'm guessing like on, you know, the mean's gonna be three, but it's probably gonna be an extra exponential distribution where some nodes have hundreds of channels because they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And then some people have one and they just open one channel and they don't use it too much and that's enough for them. So. We have another question over to your right. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I think you can make the set hash uh, no input slightly safer by also signing the input value. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this <laughs> that that would comment. also be an option. Um, the other question is, uh, does it mean the hubs of the Lightning Network, they have to store a lot of money in a hot wallet, and would it be an issue? Uh, yeah, so, you know, in, in there's going to be people with fairly lots of channels, lots of hops. Um, the nice thing about, if you look at sort of graph theory and how these things work, it ends up working a lot better than you'd expect in that even if you have you know hundreds of millions of nodes and each node only has a couple channels, uh, you still get you know six or seven hops is like the most you ever need to do. Um, and so it's, you know, it, and also if you ever are unable to route a payment through the hops, like, you know, the channels aren't big enough, you can always just open a new channel. You want it so that, you know, Opening a channel is not a huge deal. Okay, question so, over here. Yeah. Oh, hi, I'm wondering, like you described this, like uh, hops, like between channels. So, like, how hard is it to implement it automatically in the current version of Bitcoin? Uh, uh, automatically, as in the automate to find like channels, hops. Oh, so so path discovery and routing is another whole issue. It doesn't. It's hard. It's 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 cool. It's hard work. We're working on it. And it's you know definitely possible. It's not really Bitcoin related in that the Bitcoin network doesn't see that stuff, right? So it doesn't. It never ends up on the blockchain. It never. It it's not something that we have to. That's something the the clients themselves can work on, and Bitcoin doesn't have to worry about. So like, um, but it but it's it's not too bad, right? There's there's this there's a lot of research doing that kind of stuff already. Oh, and also, can you like uh, improve privacy in your framework? Yeah, there's, there's privacy. Uh, you can do sort of onion routing for payments, lots of cool stuff like that. Um, that might be sort of later on. I kind of, you know, initially we'll try to get something that's maybe not as private, maybe not as, you know, hackery, uh, and then try to scale it up from there. <laughs> okay. Um, so with those large numbers that this would be able to support, what happens if a big hub goes uncooperative or even malicious? and a large number of users suddenly have to set, uh, settle on the blockchain, how would this play out in the different levels and what kind of attacks would be possible, for example, if the hub decides to be malicious and fill up the right. blocks? Right, so the first line of defense there is try to make sure there isn't a mega hop or a mega node that, you know, hub kind of, that's got millions of channels open because if that node goes down or goes rogue, then yeah, you're gonna have this huge backlog of Mil potentially millions of people trying to close out their channels. And if that exceeds the channel duration, that sort of op CSV time, bad things could happen. People could potentially lose money. Um, so, you know, first is try to make sure the network doesn't look like that so that that's not so much of an issue. The other is there's, people have been talking about, you could have some kind of time lock, time stop, where, um, you know, if blocks are super congested, the check sequence verify doesn't increment. So if, you know, if you've got this huge backlog of people trying to close out channels, you've got this sort of statue of limitations freeze where, okay, even though it was a week and it's been two weeks, that whole week everyone was trying to close out. Um, but, but I think a cleaner, easier way is just try to make sure the network topology doesn't look like that. So even if a node does go down, it's okay. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Our next speaker is Joseph Poon. Joseph will talk about network topologies and their scalability implications on decentralized off-chain networks. Hi, I'm Joseph Poon. Um, originally, I was gonna do like a quick review on Lightning, um, but I'll keep it as short as possible because I think everyone here already knows um, the general idea behind payment channels. 
Um, but Lightning uses multi-signature payment channels. Um, these are real Bitcoin transactions. This isn't like some kind of overlay network where you know it's you know like you delegate funds into like a different coin or anything like that. This is this real Bitcoin. You're making real Bitcoin transactions, and it's sort of interesting because you know the original idea behind Bitcoin was solving the double spend problem. Um, it, when you move off chain and off a block, um, you you sort of have this opposite situation where you use double spends to your advantage, right? You're sort of spending from the same output, except you're ordering them locally. You know, you have this global consensus of blocks, but you have a local cons local order that you establish through the system of penalties. And through the system of penalties, you can you can update the balance between two people. So you have funds in a multi-sig, and you both say, okay, who owns what? Um, and through the system, there's no delegation of custody to a third party. So there's no, you know, um, you don't put all your money in exchange and that type of structure. Um, by having a network of these channels, you can do atomic payments across this network of channels. And it's functionally instant, um, instant defining as like, you know, within a couple seconds, not like 10 minutes. Um, hypothetically, if someone's in the same, everyone's in the same room, you could probably do it within milliseconds. Um, and it enables micropayments because you don't hit the blockchain every time. You can, you can update the state very frequently. Um, yesterday, everyone, like, it seemed like a lot of people were talking about um, the idea of you know, block sizes and what it really means. And I think what got really lost in the conversation was about what really happens to Bitcoin long term. What really happens when block rewards go close to zero, asymptotically close to zero? Um, Transaction fees can like pay f pay for miners, like that's the idea, right? And I think any shift for, there there may be alternate proposals, but I think like most people in the room think you know like that's probably what's going to happen as block rewards go down, you know, from you know twenty five, twelve point five, you know, all the way down close to zero. Um, commensurately, as transaction volume goes up, transaction fees go up in aggregate, and it, it can account for that, and we can have security of the Bitcoin network. Um, to account for that. However fees operate in a market, if you're a miner, if you're a miner and you're a mining pool or whatever the entity may be, the costs are, are dependent and in in your income are dependent on what the other miners are willing to do. So if you're not willing to mine, let's say, you know, a very low value transaction, the miner next door will, is, will be willing to, you know. Um, as a result, everyone's going to be willing to mine whatever they can. So if you have a block capacity of, let's say, you know, however many gigabytes, you're going to want to include as many transactions as possible, provided that you know, there's, no orf there's minimal orphan risk, right? So if you, don't, if, you, if you don't have any constraints, fees will approach zero. So functionally, the larger the block sizes are, the less in aggregate fee you as a miner can get. However, in the opposite direction, let's say we reduce block sizes down to 100 kilobytes, right? If block sizes are constraints, fees become incredibly large, and it's possible that the fees would be too large to make many kinds of on-chain payments that we can do today, right? Like in, in Bitcoin, you can probably pay for a cup of coffee. I mean, like the delay is not fun, but you can make like a $5 payment. You know, the fees are, you know, somewhere around 5 to 10 cents, whatever, right? That's not fun. On-chain transactions, you know, like you got still, you know, like... It's non-zero, but it's doable. If block size are constrained to, let's say, 100 kilobytes today, you probably can't use it day to day. And you probably can't use it even like for large payments. It would probably be a more institutional use case. And that's a huge problem because there's this, there's this dual tension, right? And when you have this dual tension where you need to be able to enforce the security of the network, and you as well as, you know, um, the ability to use the system, you're going to be reaching this, this sort of local maxima. And ultimately, I think, if you want to say what the long-term value of systems like Lightning is that it really is about solving this long-term long mining incentive that's sort of like at, at, at odds with each other. And when the fees start being high, uh, Lightning still works, and that's the idea. So with higher fees to pay for mining security, we need to be able to make micropayments and everyday purchases using real Bitcoin, right? Like you can, you can.
and have 